Our penultimate uh, talk is, uh, provides us with uh, an insight into the world of anti-counterfeiting. Uh, for me, counterfeiting is the biggest IP problem that we have on the continent. Uh, we have a, a department that specializes in anti-counterfeiting. They do, on average, three raids a day, and I suspect that they hardly even uh, touch the surface of the problem. But in any event, they are there, they're very efficient. Um, thanks, John. And uh, Tai is going to uh, give us an update um, on this very important topic. Uh, just to give you some introduction on Tay, she's an IP attorney specializing in anti-counterfeiting. She assists clients in fighting the battle against counterfeit goods on a daily basis, and it really is a fight, um, and she loves the challenge. Uh, Tay believes uniquely that animals should have the same rights as humans, so I'm not sure where that takes us, but over to you. Everybody, my changing face of counterfeiting um, and the alternative strategies to counterfeit FMCG. If we have a look, if we just start off with some statistics to put us in the picture, the trade in counterfeit goods is estimated at $462 billion annually. A massive 63.2% si of those are believed to originate from China, and to make it more locally appropriate, like Darren mentioned, about three raids are carried out every single day in South Africa. Generally, counterfeiting has been seen to affect luxury goods, but more and more we are now seeing that things are changing with FMCG products, which are fast-moving consumer goods. Fast-moving consumer goods are those that are sold quickly and at a relatively low cost. Some of the statistics that are specifically for FMCG are um, the counterfeit kind of problems that we've experienced, for example, the stats on the side, in 2014, an estimated 30,000 bottles of vodka made from antifreeze caused a health scare across Europe. Across Europe. Um, with, with, with babies, it's a massive, massive problem. We find counterfeit toys. We also find counterfeit baby formula. This has been a problem over the last 10 years. So these are not isolated incidences, and in, in some cases, we find that it's actually on the rise. The one at the bottom has to do with pharmaceuticals. Between 40 and 50% of counterfeit pharmaceuticals are readily available in East and West Africa on the street. You don't even have to look very far. You don't need to go to some backyard alley readily available on the street. So the statistics are staggering. Now if we move on to have a look at what are, the, what, are, what are the challenges specific to FMCG counterfeits. One of the problems is, as the name suggests, they are fast moving. So by the time a, a counterfeit product comes to your attention, it might already be gone. By the time you get to the market, it's already been sold. So because they are in such high demand and sold at a relatively low cost, the demand is high, the supply is there, by the time you get to it, the goods have already been distributed and it's difficult to follow each of them into the market. Another problem is that there's not only one type of counterfeiter. With FMCG products, it's quite wide ranging. It's a wide ranging problem, it's quite widespread. Your counterfeiters range all the way from the vendor on the side of the street to bigger retailers and wholesalers, which I'll touch in in a moment. An interesting legal problem is brand owners might find that they end up suing their own customers. And the reason for that is because they don't know that it's counterfeit. The price points are often the same, and large wholesalers may unknowingly be mixing genuine products with counterfeit products. The purpose of this presentation is to have a look at what can we do for FMCG counterfeits that's different to traditional luxury goods, clothing, footwear. That's the, the, the traditional view of counterfeit goods, is the counterfeit t-shirt and sneaker that you might find on the side of the road. So we need to think a little bit outside the box when we consider what can be done with these type of products, because just as they are unique challenges, they should also be unique solutions. Something that, 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 is, that is up and coming is something that's called soft enforcement. So the traditional approach has always been 
it's been done and dusted over and over and over. We get the lo local law enforcement involved, we do investigations, we do raids, and that's why the statistics of three raids a day stands, because it's an ongoing process. But the soft approach is an interesting take on this, because it, 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 if you have a look at the round thing, it includes goods replacement. Now, this might raise some eyebrows. It, it means going to the market and replacing the counterfeit goods with the genuine goods. And you might think, well, how does that solve the problem? And it's, it's all about education. So you need to educate consumers. You also need to educate sellers who may or may not know that they're selling counterfeit goods. And then um, friendly visits on the left-hand side, that refers to maybe a, a bigger supplier. So for the, for the small local retailer, you may consider a, a friendly visit just by the brand holder. For larger wholesalers, you may consider um, attorney involvement in those friendly visits. So you have to gauge each of them on a case-by-case -case basis and see what is appropriate in the circumstances. And the whole aim in the soft enforcement is to avoid antagonizing your existing distributors who might unknowingly be part of the problem, and also to educate the public and educate the sellers so it's not your traditional go in with a raid and you seize all the products. Oh, if we can just go back. If soft enforcement doesn't work, there's always the opportunity to go with the traditional enforcement or possibly a tiered approach. So the traditional enforcement is always there and is always an option, but this is trying to look out of the box for soft enforcement options, which may or may not be appropriate. Then we look at other strategies that aren't necessarily FMCG um, only related. So what I spoke about earlier was education. Um, it's, it's very difficult to tell if something is, is a counterfeit uh, soap, for example. Uh, you know, the packaging might look identical. There, there might not be anything to alert the customer that the goods might be counterfeit. And this is where the problem comes in because the overriding consideration with counterfeit FMCG is health and safety. You are consuming these products. If it's food and drink, you're applying it to your body. You, you're feeding your baby. Um, so it, it's important for educating, educating, getting it part of your brand protection, some PR exercises to inform the public of what's out there, because the public is acutely aware of the counterfeit uh, luxury goods, but maybe a little less so with these kind of products. So education in this instance is definitely key. Um, other options are regular amendments to packaging. So counterfeiters have, over the years, gotten much, much, much better to keeping up with the trends. And as the packaging uh, stays the same for the last 10 years, so the counterfeiter will have a carbon copy of your, of your packaging and, you know, we need to be innovative, we need to be changing things and rebranding or repackaging and updating your packaging is something um, th that you should look at. Um, counterfeiters tend not to pay that much attention to detail, so, um, you know, having, having quite a... Um, having your address set out, a customer care number for consumers to call. Counterfeiters tend to sometimes get that wrong. Spelling errors are, are common in, in these kind of products. Um, but also, let's be honest, you're not scrutinizing your bar of soap before you put it on your body. Uh, the last one over there is, is labeling. So we've had in, in the last few years with the um, development of technology, it's been very interesting, different packaging solutions, um, QR coding, holograms, you know, you see it in the, you see it with cell phones, you see it with, um, um, you know, all sorts of products where there's, there's a hologram embedded into the product, which the counterfeiters tend to be able to copy, but those copies are generally quite, uh, the copies are quite poor. Um, so basically, the bottom line in all of this is we need to be aware. We need to be educated, we need to be doing the educating, and the bottom line is we must beat the counterfeiters at their own game. And that's it.